So spake our mother Eve. And Adam heard well pleased, but answered not, for now too nigh the archangel stood. And from the other hill to their fixed station, all in bright array, the cherubim descended on the ground gliding meteorous as evening mist risen from a river over the marsh glides and gathers ground fast at the laborer's heel homeward returning. High in front advanced the brandished sword of God before them blazed fierce as a comet which with torrid heat and vapor as the Libyan air adust, began to parch that temperate climb. As Adam and Eve are being led out of paradise, which they have now lost by God's archangel Michael, the end of book 12 of Paradise Lost, which I consider one of the greatest works of art in all of human history. The heat of the sword of God is so great that the green verdant paradisical garden is now turning into a desert. Whereat in either hand, the hastening angel caught our lingering parents and to the Eastern gate led them direct and down the cliff as fast to the subjected plain. Then, disappeared. And Adam and Eve look at each other. Where did that angel go? He was holding our hands. He was leading us out of the gate, out of paradise, out of the garden, into what is this? There's nothing but sand and heat and death. The angel has left them. They've lost the presence of the holy. They've lost their relationship with their creator. They, looking back, all the eastern side beheld of paradise, so late their happy seat. Waved over by that flaming sword, the gate with dreadful faces thronged and fiery arms. As they look back, they see the now shut and locked gates of paradise. And through the bars of the gate, they see burning cherubic and seraphic faces waved over with a huge flaming sword, telling him, don't even think about coming back here. Paradise is lost. Some natural tears they dropped, but wiped them soon. The world was all before them, where to choose their place of rest. And providence, their guide. They, hand in hand, with wandering steps and slow, through Eden, took their solitary way. Now this poetic imagery shows what it means to be a fallen human being. They're solitary. In the end, we're kind of all alone, aren't we? Even with each other, they're still alone because they are separated from their God, from their creator. So they hold hands and they walk through the garden. They're wandering. They know that providence can be their guide. The world is all before them. And now, under the guiding hand of God's providence, they have to choose their place of rest. Now, when I first started teaching, a little over 30 years ago, I was teaching an undergraduate college literature course on medieval and Renaissance literature. And I'd read a little bit of Milton in college and I couldn't stand him. I hated the guy. I thought he was boring. I thought he was obnoxious. I thought he was pretentious. Now I was a Christian and I thought I would like him because he was a Christian, but I heard he was a heretic and that he was boring and pretentious and obnoxious. So I pretty much just left him off my syllabus, which is probably uh, professional malpractice because over the years, I began to appreciate Milton more and more and have now built a large part of my scholarly career over him. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background about who Milton is and try and <clears throat> to use Milton's words and flame you with the study of learning. I want you to be on fire about this great, magnificent Christian 
theological Puritan poet, I want you to be as excited about him as I am. Not just you can do well in the CLT and you know ace all your college literature class and go on and become a fabulous person. I want you to learn from him what it means to live and believe and die as a Christian who wanders through a fallen and broken world, fallen and broken yourself, and I would hope redeemed by Christ, and to trust his providence and to find your place of rest in trusting him. A lot of uh, scholars of intellectual history say that John Milton is probably the greatest genius of the 17th century, which is known as the century of genius. He's probably one of the most brilliant, best educated, most deeply thoughtful, and incredibly productive people in all of human cultural history. He's born in 1608. For the 17th century, he lives a long time. He lives until 1674. He lives well into his 60s. And we know exactly where his house was when he was growing up in London. It was on Bread Street. The house itself is gone. But we also know that right around the corner was a little tavern, a little public house, a pub, that two famous late 16th, early 17th century poets used to hang out to drink and talk about poetry. You may have heard of them, Ben Johnson and Will Shakespeare. And I like to imagine the famous Johnson and Shakespeare walking down Bread Street on the way to their afternoon of poetry reading and passing a little redheaded kid who had no idea that he was going to be influenced by Johnson and Shakespeare and all the other great writers in Western culture and would want to imitate them. And in many ways, perhaps I think we might even say surpass them. Uh, John's father was a businessman. He was what they called a scrivener, kind of like a lawyer, a preparer of documents. They recognized early on that their little redheaded boy was incredibly brilliant. They sent him to St. Paul's School, which is very much what we would call a classical school now. It was attached to St. Paul's Cathedral in downtown London. And very early on, he had an incredible mastery of all the disciplines that he studied, particularly the languages. By the time he was 10, he had mastered Latin and Greek. In his middle teenage years, he knew French, Spanish. Before long, he knew Portuguese. The guy who becomes the founder of Providence, Rhode Island, Roger Williams, met Milton and decided he wanted to learn <clears throat> uh, Hebrew from Milton and Williams had been in the Netherlands. He'd gone down there with some of the Puritan and learned Dutch. And so Milton and Williams agreed to tutor each other over the summer before Williams and some of his Puritans would go off to the New World. At the end of the summer, Williams writes in his diary, well, after three months, young Master Milton has mastered Dutch and I have a smattering of Hebrew. Milton was 15. By the time he's in his 30s, he appears to be proficient in two dozen languages. He's probably what we would now call eidetic or photographic memory, an incredibly brilliant, brilliant guy. He goes to Cambridge University in 1624 uh, uh, or five, graduates with his undergraduate degree in 29. He receives a master's degree in 1632. And <clears throat> his father sent him to Cambridge in order to prepare him for ministry. They wanted to give this young man's mind to the ministry, but Milton ends up not going in that direction. He becomes very uh, complexly oriented towards uh, some other things, particularly some political debates. But what you want to know about Milton is since he was a little kid, he was a voracious reader. He said every night he sat up late reading by candlelight. He ends up deciding that the, that the, the Anglican Protestant church in England, when he would be moving towards being ordained in it, was becoming too Catholic for his taste. He decided he could not support that. He felt that God wanted him to become a poet and a writer and kind of a Christian intellectual. And then after he graduates, his, his father supports six more years of study. So he moves into his father's country house out in the countryside in Buckinghamshire, and he spends six years reading through everything in classical Greek and Latin literature twice, taking extensive notes, reading in the original languages twice, everything by Aristotle, everything by Plato, and dozens of people, even students like you have never even heard of. Incredibly brilliant and well-educated. By the time we move into the 1630s, he's written a number of poems that are already published and famous. His first publication when he was still an undergraduate college student at Cambridge was a poem about Shakespeare that was published at the front of the first edition of Shakespeare's complete works in 1623. That's a pretty good first publication for anyone. Um, <clears throat> he writes an amazing little book in 1644 called Of Education, the theories about Christian education 
that are expounded upon in his little book of education are really the root of the entire classical education movement. The same summer, the same month, he writes a book called Areopagitica, which is the foundation of the idea of freedom of thought, freedom of speech, and freedom of the press that we find in the American founding documents. He's really the intellectual father of freedom of the press, particularly. He writes a number of other uh, different kind of polemical works uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the following uh, uh, couple of decades. And um, let me see, let me move this uh, I'll note up here. And... Um, where did that go? Sorry, I just lost something here that I was trying to work on. Sorry, I just got a little technical issue right here. There we go. He was actually married three times. His first two wives, Mary and Catherine, uh, uh, died. He was heavily involved in what we would call the Republican Revolution against the monarchy in the middle of the 17th century in England. He was directly involved in the beheading of the first European king by his people, Charles I. Um, and uh, when Charles I's son comes back from, uh, from exile in France, uh, in 1660, John Milton, who was the most famous intellectual in Europe at the time, he wrote prose, he wrote poetry, he wrote theological works, political theory. He wrote the first history of Russia, believe it or not. Incredible, incredible scholar. Milton ends up imprisoned for regicide, for being involved in the execution of Charles I. He is reduced to poverty. And uh, I've actually seen the warrant in England, the actual physical warrant, for him to be drawn and quartered and beheaded. He was facing death. One of his friends, the famous poet Thomas uh, 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 Andrew Marvell, manages to basically bail him out in front of parliament that we can't kill our most famous intellectual and poet. And so Milton is released. He is reputation in many ways is destroyed. The kind of Puritan revolution that he was trying to lead has collapsed. And so he sits down in the last few years of his life and he begins dictating Paradise Lost, probably one of the greatest and most famous works in any literary language at all. Oh, by the way, I may have forgotten to mention one thing to you. Why did he dictate Paradise Lost? He was blind. Sometime around 1650 to 1652, in his early 40s, the most brilliant reader, writer, scholar of the late Renaissance loses his sight. This is like an Olympic athlete becoming quadriplegic. He loses everything. And then he ends up in a dungeon waiting to be torn to pieces by his political enemies. But when he is released, he realizes that God has worked everything according to his perfect plan. And now that he's taken away Milton's sight and left Milton with a mind that is quite literally a walking library, people who would hang out with Milton and they would mention a passage in Homer's Iliad or Odyssey, right? And then Milton would just begin to quote from memory hundreds of lines of classical Greek Homeric poetry. An astonishing, astonishing mind. Milton's whole purpose in his great epic written at the end of his life, where he's lost everything. He's lost two wives. He's got troubled relationships with, with, his, with his own daughters. His, all of his political dreams have failed. Many people have mocked him, said, God took away your sight because you chopped off your, your, your king's head. In the face of all of this, Milton, who is suffering, decides to write an epic the entire point of which is to justify the ways of God to man, to show that God is good, God is sovereign, God is in control, and even in the face of evil, for which we often wish to blame God, God's sovereign plan is always, always, always just. And that's what I wanted to start off with sharing you. Now, some of you may have read some Paradise Lost, hopefully all of it. You should certainly read it all at some point. Um, but the most famous of Milton's shorter poems is actually Sonnet 19. 
So you can actually find this online. There are a number of places. You may have it in a textbook or a copy of Milton's works. I want to read Milton's Sonnet 19. The sonnet form is an Italian form of poetry. Sonnet is just Italian for a little song. It becomes very popular in England in the 16th and 17th centuries. And um, Milton is one of the guys who's really a master of sonneteering. It's a small, very kind of gem-like, beautifully produced, carefully crafted piece of rhetoric that is designed to be beautiful and intellectually stimulating and like all poetry, all art, to communicate something that the author thinks you need to think about. Well, Milton had a lot of time to think after he lost his eyesight in 1652. He lives for nearly another quarter century. He's blind longer than most students who show up at college and graduate have been alive. And sometime within a year or two after losing his sight, where he can no longer do his favorite thing, reading, reading the Greek and Latin classics, reading French plays, reading Italian poetry, studying the, the great literary and philosophical and most importantly, theological traditions of human history. And of course, the most important thing that anyone can ever read, he can no longer read the scripture, not with his eyes. But Milton would say, because he had read scripture so much, and he'd read all the other works so much, that his library was in his head. And when he wanted to read, he would just open the book in his mind. In the beginning, God created the heavens, and he would just run through Genesis. So he's sitting in the dark. This is a man who, by all human appearances, has lost everything. He's a scholar who's lost his sight. And so this is the sonnet. He writes several sonnets actually about going blind. And this is his most famous one. I think it's maybe the greatest sonnet in the English language. When I consider how my light is spent, ere half my days in this dark world and wide, and that one talent, which is death to hide, lodged with me useless, though my soul more bent to serve therewith my maker and present my true account, lest he returning chide, doth God exact day labor, light denied, I fondly asked. But patience to prevent that murmur soon replies. So in the kind of opening eight or nine lines of the sonnet. The sonnet has a very unusual, very complex structure. He says, when I stop and sit down and think about how my light is bent, how God has taken the light out of my eye, I can no longer see, I can no longer read. I can't look at the, Milton married two women he never saw. He married Elizabeth Minshall in uh, uh, 16, uh, 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 50 uh, or so, and, and he probably was blind at that time. When he married Mary Powell in 1642, he was 31, she was 16, typical 17th century type stuff. Um, he saw her, fell in love with her, they got married. Um, but then he married two more women that he never saw, right? He, can, he, can't, he can't look at his wife. He can't look at his daughters. He can't watch the sun rise or set. Milton loved his garden. I've been to Milton's house in Shelfons and Giles in Buckinghamshire, England, near Oxford. And uh, I sat in his garden. I have clippings from some of the plants from his garden from the 17th century all over, over, all over the office from which I'm, I'm, I'm recording this, right? He loved his garden. He would sit out there. He would look at the plants. He would look at the work of God and the craft of man, which is what gardening is. Remember, time begins in a garden. Gardening is the most natural of all human arts where we mold nature, as God originally designed us to do, to give us the pleasure through which we can praise God. But he couldn't look at his roses. He couldn't look at his ivy. He couldn't look at his cypress trees. He couldn't see his pines anymore. So when I consider how my light is spent, when I sit down in the dark alone and I think, my light is gone. My eyes have stopped working. And he's like, I'm, I'm halfway through my life. And the world is already dark and wide. And, and now I'm blind in a world of blindness, spiritual blindness. And then he makes a reference, which you'll understand, uh, to Matthew, right, in the parables, and he talks about the parable of the talents, right? You remember the story of the parable of the talents, right? The steward says, 
you know, that, that, that he's going to watch over what the master leaves and the master's going away is going to come back later. I want you to invest what you have here. And, and so, you know, so, some people will get 10 talents and some five and some one, some people get a whole lot. Some people get medium, some, some people get a little and the master who is the owner of those, of those talents, which then really means money. Now we would understand it as things you're able to do through the gifts of God. Some people go out and invest their 10 or their eight or their five, and that's a risk. Investment is always a risk, but they risk it because that is their job to deploy and employ their talent and then earn more back and give it to their master when he returns. They're managing someone's finances, essentially. But there was a guy who's given one talent. He's like, oh man, my master, he's a tough guy. He, you know, he wants to collect where, you know, where he hasn't really done the work. And man, if he comes back and I lose this money, he's going to be so upset with me, right? This is Jesus' story in Matthew 25, right? And, and so he buries it. The master comes back and he starts to collect and he gets to the guy with the one talent. He said, I've rewarded all these people because they invested what I gave them and I gave it to you and you buried it? You buried what I get. What you only bury things that are dead. And he said, I'm going to take away what I've given you. So Milton thinks that God gave him a phenomenal mind, an incredible education, a father who supported him all the way through what we would call K through 12 classical, and then you know, a couple of degrees at Cambridge University. That's a pretty good education, right? And then supports his son, who doesn't have a job, for six years of reading in the countryside. This is phenomenal. And at the height of his powers, when he's the most famous intellectual in England, maybe in Europe, he goes blind. He begins to wonder, maybe God actually did call me to enter the ministry. And God has taken away my sight because I didn't. And instead, I became a poet. And his enemies are mocking it openly. They're writing books and poems about him. God took away his sight. He thinks, God gave me one talent, my mind, my creative ability, my education, and it's death to hide it. And now God has taken that away by removing my sight. He says in the, the second set of four lines there, now more than ever, I want to serve my maker. And he starts to think through that talent. He's like, oh, wait a minute. Is God going to expect a full day's work when it's dark outside? Does God exact day labor light denied? He does not do that. Now, what's interesting about this line, and I've read a lot of stuff about Milton and written a couple of books about him, a bunch of articles, is that all the Milton scholars and all their little footnoted editions, they mentioned the parable of the talents from Matthew. But here at line seven, right in the middle of the poem, Milton mentions another one of Jesus's parables. Does God exact day labor light denied. And I have never seen anyone publish anything on that. They think it's still the parable of the talents, but it's not. Milton shifts the metaphorical reference to Jesus' story to the parable of the farmer needs to hire day laborers. At you know daybreak, he goes down to the well in the center of town. Here's 10 guys sitting around. He hires those guys. Come work in the farm. I'm going to pay you, you know, a dollar a day. And he comes back at nine o'clock in the morning. Oh, here's more guys. Well, they need work. I'm going to hire them. I'm going to pay you what's right. And he goes at noon. He goes at three. He goes at six. Then he goes as the sun's going down. The work is about to end. There's more guys standing around. They need work. So he says, come back. I'm going to pay you what's right. Some people show up at the farm. The sun is down. You can't work on the farm in the dark. And he pays everyone in reverse order. He pays the guys who simply show up and don't even do any work. And he pays them a day's wages. And then the people who showed up at six o'clock and worked for three hours, and the people who showed up at noon and worked for five hours, he pays them all a day's wages. And then everyone in line starts doing what? Doing the one thing God tells us he hates the most, grumbling complaining, whining, well, 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 you know, and so the people at the back of the line who worked all day and sweated all through morning and noon and afternoon are like, you're paying me the same as the people who did nothing? What kind of master are you, right? That's the parable of the labors, and this is what he's talking about here. Does God exact, God will not expect you have to have done a full day's work if he turns out the lights, so it's like Milton is talking to himself as he writes the poem, do not grumble against God. He took away your sight. He didn't take away your talent. He's turned off the lights. So light a candle. And so when you get down uh, to line eight, he says, I fondly ask. In the 17th century, fondly doesn't mean, oh, I'm so fond of my grandchildren. Fondly means foolishly. 
So he foolishly is trying to figure out, do I grumble? Should I grumble? What should I do? And then someone comes in, kind of the personification of patience, but patience to prevent that murmur sooner plus. So just picture patience coming in. And patience says, John, stop. Don't murmur against God. He hates that. He gave you his eyes. He can take the eyes back. And then Patience says this, and th this is one of the most staggering couple of lines in all of English literary history, I think. It's also one of the most richly theological, and it's a great thing just to learn. Patience speaks for the next five and a half lines. God doth not need either man's work or his own gifts. You, you think God needs you, John Milton? Maybe he did make you the most brilliant guy in the world. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need you, he doesn't need your talents, and he doesn't need your work. Milton, since he was a young teenager and loved Homer and loved Virgil, wanted to write an epic. He wanted to be like a Christian Homer, a Christian Virgil, a, a Protestant Dante, right? That's what he wanted to do. He gets to the middle of his life, he loses his sight. He's like, now I can't do it, I can't see, I can't read, I can't write. And then he got, well, actually, Homer was blind, wasn't he? Right? So patient tells him, you think God needs you? All you have to offer him is something that he gave you. He doesn't need man's work or his own gifts. And then, kind of a little bit of a parenthetical clause here, who best, and we would say whoever, whoever best bear his mild yoke, they serve him best. What did Jesus tell you to do? Write epic poetry? Conquer the world? No. He said, get into the yoke lean in and begin to plow the row that God has given you. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Your job is to pull it, whatever it is, sighted, blind, doesn't matter, pull. Then he says, patient says, they serve him best when they bear his mild yoke. And then we have this enjambed line. Enjambment is when a poetic line ends, but the thought continues to the next line. And what that does, because your eye is, is always kind of flicking back and forth as you read, it's called cessating, right? Your eyes, as you're, as you're kind of reading, but then it takes a little bit longer. It takes a millisecond longer to go from the end of this line down to that line. So for a moment, there's a pause and it causes suspense just for a millisecond in the reader. His state, whose state? His state, bang, here it comes, is kingly. God is a king. He is a king, and he is to be served like a king. His state is king. You're lucky to serve him, blind or sighted. His state is kingly. And then this phenomenal image, thousands at his bidding speed and post or land and ocean without rest. Who are the thousands, the, 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 the millions, the mille that are, God says, go here, they go there, go here. They're the angels, the angeloi in Greek, right? Angeloi are messengers. And God says, go. They go all over the land and the sea and the ocean, from one end of the universe in a heartbeat. And then the last line, they also serve who only stand and wait. You see, here's one of the great theological mysteries of, of believing in the one true God. He may give you incredible ability, and he may give you almost none. And if he gives you incredible ability, he may give you the opportunity to deploy all of it, and you will do amazing things and become famous the world over. Or he may give you the incredible ability and never give you the opportunity to use it. He may give you no ability, and then you accomplish amazing things through him. Or he may give you no ability, and you just remain an invisible nobody. None of that matters. The status and the accomplishment never matters. All that matters in Miltonic thinking, all that matters is the obedience of the heart, what Paul calls the obedience of faith. What matters is that you are ready to go.
If you go off and you train to become a missionary or a pastor or a nurse or a doctor or a homeschool mom or a farmer or a poet or anything else or train to do nothing, what matters is not whether you accomplish anything that the world or other people can see. What matters is, does your heart belong to Jesus? Does your mind strive after God to love him with your heart, soul, mind, and strength? And are you ready and willing to take gladly whatever he puts in front of you? They also serve who only stand and wait. Think about that image. God has angels that are zipping all over the universe right now. But there are also cherubim and seraphim who do nothing more than stand in his presence, awaiting his command. And they may go throughout all the rest of eternity doing nothing. But if they are standing and waiting upon God, then, then he's pleased with them. And that's a little glimpse of how Milton works. I actually want to take you to a very, very uh, small line in another one of uh, Milton's uh, famous poems. He writes when he's just a teenager, 19 years old, this beautiful, beautiful poem called uh, The Nativity Ode. And in the Nativity Ode, he's basically writing a Christmas poem to give it to Jesus as a gift on Jesus's birthday. This is pretty cool for a 19-year-old. And it's so learned and so brilliant. It's quite long. We're not going to read it. But there is a line where as Christ is entering the world on that morning in Bethlehem of Judea, in fulfillment of the prophecy in Micah 5, 2, where the ruler of the world, the one who is empowered to rule it, Satan, is running around trying to get people to worship false gods and commit all kinds of immorality and be wicked and atheistic and materialistic and everything else, right? Satan, it's like he hears something. It's like a little baby's cry somewhere. He's been waiting for this guy to show up. This is another trope that he uses in Paradise Lost, right? And it says, Satan, he hears from Judah's land, the dreaded infant's hand. Now, that's, a, that's what we call a couplet. It's two lines, one after another, that rhyme. It's a rhyming couplet. Shakespeare uses them, Spencer uses them, Sidney, Wyatt, Surrey, all the 16th, 17th century poets use them. English poetry tends to be rhyme-driven and metrically driven. Greek and Latin poetry is a little, little bit different. Um, but Milton is a master of those little gem-like two-line couplets, right? Like through Eden, they solitary through Eden took hand in hand, took their solitary way at the end of Paradise Lost, right? He hears in Judah's land, or he feels in Judah's land. I don't have it in front of me, I'm trying to remember. He feels in Judah's land, the dreaded infant's hand. Now think about that imagery. What do you think of a person who dreads an infant? What kind of person... Dread now changing a diaper for the first time is a little nerve wracking. Holding a newborn for the first time is a little scary, whether it's yours or somebody else's. It's a big responsibility. We just welcomed our seventh wonderful grandchild into the world very recently. And you know, I just got to hold her for hours and hours a day up in Alaska for a whole month straight. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. It was just beautiful little girl, right? But what would you think of someone who sees an infant hand, right? And an infant can wrap their whole hand around your little finger and can barely get it because they're so small they're helpless they're completely fragile they're the most tender thing in the world who fears an infant's hand there's only one descriptor for someone who fears an infant's hand a coward and so milton is constantly building this trope of satan and the demons the ones who lead the fall away from god and eventually tempt eve and then adam away from god ultimately they are cowardly satan appears all through paradise lost as titanic and massive and gigantic but he's actually a fool he's rhetor rhetorically very slippery but he's not nearly as intelligent as he thinks he is and in the end he's a coward because what what tricks takes true courage is to turn back to God when you have sinned and to repent of your sins and submit to him. And Satan is as far, you know, Satan even says in the opening of book five, I am as far from asking his grace as he is from granting it, 
right? But that's not the way it works with human beings where God is constantly offering grace. So I hope that little taste of uh, the magnificent John Milton uh, maybe excites you uh, a little bit. He's a, he's maybe the greatest thinker about classical Christian education ever. Uh, the giant ACCS conference every year is titled Repairing the Ruins. You know where they got that? That is a line from John Milton's Of Education. The end of all learning is to repair the ruins of our first parents by returning to know God or right and out of that love, uh, uh, yeah, so to, to know God or right and out of that knowledge to love him, imitate him, and be like him, right? It's to repair the ruins. Um, I uh, 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 live in an interesting world. I'm in a very, very kind of biblically conservative Christian liberal arts college. I love it. I love living in Italy in the summer with my students. I love spending time at our coffee shop with our students here. It's just a magnificent thing. We have dinners and poetry readings and movie nights at my house and my garden. My wife hosts students uh, all the time. But I'm also a Milton scholar and I publish a fair amount of stuff. And Milton scholars, you know, they're academics with PhDs in literature and they tend to be very, very, very atheist and very, very liberal and left wing and they, you know, they hate, they hate Christianity, they hate Christians, and Christians are stupid, and uh, Milton, blah, 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 and they all are convinced that Milton must be a heretic, because nobody that smart could be a Puritan and believe the Bible and love Jesus, right, and a couple of years ago, the new book that I, that I have been working on for many years about uh, Milton and his relationship with, with Reformed theology, I was invited to give a talk on that at Strasbourg in France at the 12th, uh, uh, Mil international Milton Symposium, all the top Milton scholars in the world. They're all there. And I'm like, I'm a nobody from nowhere, a college, a little school no one's ever heard of. And so I go, and my wife's like, are you nervous? I'm like, they're the ones that should be nervous, right? God lives inside of me. And I've studied my Milton. I know my Bible, my theology. So I go up and I kind of, you know, did my talk and, you know, everybody was like ready to get into a fist fight. How can he be this smart? And some people were convinced and some people weren't. I'm only telling you that to encourage you. If God has given you a mind and you have the chance to get the kind of education you're getting doing classical studies, and perhaps to go to college, maybe even beyond that, dedicate that mind to him. And whether you succeed or not, whether you accomplish or not, doesn't matter. What matters is what he says here. They also serve who only stand and wait. All God is asking you to do is to stand and wait in his presence and love him with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Thank you, Dr. Horner. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you incorporated readings. Uh, that was a real treat. Shouldn't talk about our poet without reading some lines. Um, so anyone is welcome to put questions in the chat. Um, also draw everyone's attention again, you have the chance to win a copy of, of Paradise Lost tonight. Um, so if you haven't read it, or maybe you've annotated your copy too fully, whatever whatever purpose it serves, uh, you could win a fresh copy tonight. Um, as everyone's kind of thinking and may, maybe typing in the chat, I will go ahead and start, start us off um, with a question about Paradise Lost, just wondering, well, the first things that come to your mind would be, if I ask, like, what are uh, just some striking moments for you in in the poetry of Paradise Lost? So, like, moments that you wouldn't have imagined reading uh, the account in Genesis that, that Milton does imagine, I feel like. Yeah. The problem with getting me started talking about Milton is <laughs> I don't want to stop. And it's kind of funny because, you know, my, my wife is a, is a nationally ranked distance runner. She's an athlete. She's a, she's a highly trained artist and, and, and a phenomenal host and, and uh, students just love her. You know, we tell students in Italy, you know, come for the Horner, but stay for the Joanne because they all fall in love with her. She's, she's a blast. Uh, and so students be like, man, I can't wait to, you know, when I come over to your house, I'd like to live in your house. I want to live in the castle with you in Italy. We have this, actually, it's a, it's a giant bill. It's a castle. And, and they're like, man, we sit around and talk about philosophy and theology, art all day. I said, no, mostly my wife says, can you take out the trash? The plumbing is broken again. We need to change the world. We have a normal house. I don't go over and talk about the Renaissance. You know, that's not what we do. But when I'm with my students and we're doing stuff at school and we're off there in Italy, of course, we do it all the time. And yeah, it's, it's you know, I, I had the opportunity I was, when I was in grad school at Duke University many, many years ago 
to be taught and mentored by Stanley Fish, who's probably the most famous American literary theory guy and definitely the most famous Milton scholar maybe in the world. Not everybody likes him, but he's incredibly famous. And um, I hated Milton, but I had a chance to take his last seminar, his PhD seminar, doctoral seminar, on Milton before uh, he was going to leave Duke University and probably retire. And I was like, well, I'm going to do that. And then 30 minutes into the first PhD seminar with, you know, eight or 10 of us sitting around the table with the famous, terrifying Professor Fish, I was like, well, I'm forgetting all about Shakespeare and John Donne, and I want to become a Milton scholar now. I mean, it was that powerful. Part, part of it is that Milton is engaging in the classical tradition, as we call it, right? He studies Homer and Virgil and, and, and Ovid and Dante, and he knows his Cicero, and he's mastered the medievals and the late antiquity people. And, and he's, I mean, he's one of the guys that's creating the, the Renaissance in, in Italy. I, from what I've read, of Milton's own stuff, his favorite part of it is that he hated Cambridge. He was completely bored to death at Cambridge. You know, he's like, I've already read all this. This is boring. Um, and uh, he actually, you know, back then they were so strict that the teacher could whip the student. So he was whipped and sent home from Cambridge. <laughs> it's pretty hilarious. So uh, Milton, um, uh, uh, his favorite part of his education was he went to Italy. And he spent a year and a half there. He hung out with Galileo and looked through Galileo's telescope and mentions it twice in Paradise Lost. So one of my favorite little things, one of my favorite things about Milton are all these little moments, like he talks about the Tuscan artist who from his hill in Fiesola, which is a little village on a hill right up above Florence, uh, through optic glass spied lands on the moon, right? And Milton talks about that in book, in, in, uh, uh, book two and book seven, I believe. And and so, man, so Milton, as a young man, hangs out with this famous Renaissance genius, Galileo, who by then was blind and under house arrest from the, the Holy Office in, in the Inquisition in, in Italy, in, in Florence, and hung out with him and didn't realize that later on he was going to become famous and go blind and be imprisoned and then dictate from his memory of Galileo two beautiful passages describing what happens because people were terrified. The, the, the Pope and other people refused to look through Galileo's telescope. They thought it was a, a devil tube that would actually deceive you and lie to you, right? So little, little gems like that. Um, there's a great moment where um, Adam refers to Eve after her creation. He calls her God's last best gift. And when I teach Milton in my in my in my classes with my students, you know, I turn to all the guys and I said, guys, you realize God always saves the best for last. Right. He makes everything in order and then he makes Adam and man, that's the crown jewel of creation. Right. It's not you guys. It's the women. What did God ever make more fabulous, brilliant and beautiful than woman? Right. And all the women are like, yeah, in the class. And the guys are like, man, I need to get a date. Right. So those kind of little gems, of course, when Adam falls later in book 10, they have this huge argument, you know, they're calling each other names and he calls her a snake and she calls him weak. Why didn't you take care of me and defend me from Satan? Right. And at one point, uh, uh, you know, he calls her, he says, well, well, she says, you know, what was I never to leave you? Was I supposed to stay with you the whole time? I wandered off into the forest alone. How was I to know that there would be this, this creature out there that would, you know, do this horrible thing and deceive me? I don't even know what a lie is. I was perfect. And, you know, now she's all bent and twisted and deformed. And she says, was I never to have parted from thy side? She says, as good to remain there as a lifeless rib. She's like, what do you want me to stay attached to you? Right. And Adam comes right back there. He says, yes, you're a rib crooked by nature right? Because the rib is bent. He says, you know, God made you crooked, which is not true. God did not make Eve crooked or Adam. He made them perfect. But through their own decision, they chose to disobey God. So just those little, you know, one and two lines, and they're everywhere. And, and Paradise Lost is, is 10,576 lines long. Uh, usually when I teach my Milton class, one of the things we do is we'll do a public reading. We'll set up a microphone at the cafe, and we'll read all the way through Paradise Lost out loud. It takes about nine hours. It's phenomenal. So, yeah, I love the large and the small because it's massive, but there are these little gems everywhere. That's great. I had no idea the, the, the story of Um You mentioned a couple of Milton's prose pieces uh, while you were talking, but I was wondering if you could just list a few 
even if they're the ones you mentioned before for for our attendees. Um, right. Yeah. The most speaking. important. Yeah, Milton. You know, if you if you get a scholarly edition of Milton, the Yale edition or the Columbia edition, um, not one of like the student editions with selected works, right? It's about a four foot shelf, with, you know, tiny print and footnotes all over it. He was incredibly, incredibly productive. Um, and, uh, you know, I've read everything he's written. He wrote a lot of stuff in Latin. He wrote poetry in Hebrew and Italian and stuff like that. It, it, phenomenally productive. Um, the most important prose works by far are Areopagitica, and of education. Of education is eight or nine pages long. Every Christian should read it. Um, and it's it, and it will make, I tell my students when I teach, I said, I'm go, we're going to read this out loud. We're going to talk about it in class for the next few hours. And you're going to realize you got ripped off, no matter what kind of education you got, compared to what Milton lays out as the right way to do a Renaissance education. All of us got ripped off. Um, so students have to get over that. Uh, the other one is Areopagitica. There's a the, the, the famous passage in Areopagitica is right in the middle. Areopagitica is um, uh, kind of modeled on the idea of Paul going up on the Areopagus, right, and bringing the truth of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ to the Athenian philosophers in Acts 17 from about verse, you know, 20 through uh, 30 or so. Uh, you know, he actually quotes Epimenides and Aratus from memory. This guy, you know, Paul knew his Greek philosopher poets. He quotes them from memory to a bunch of Greek philosophers on the Areopagus. And so Milton is taking that kind of image, learn your pagan culture at an appropriate level, and then deploy the suppressed truths that Paul talks about in Romans 1, learn that and then deploy the suppressed truths in those culture against the culture for apologetic and evangelistic purposes, right? So he says, even your own poets know there's one God, he's the father, he's the author of everything, and that we're all kind of stumbling around trying to find him, but we can't do it, right? Um, so Milton is modeling on Paul in the Areopagus. He's also going back to is also going back to the ancient tradition of the Areopagus being the place where you debate things. And there's a famous debate there about what the Greeks kind of started to call freedom of speech. Should you be able to say what you wanted to about your government? So what Milton is doing is in the spring of 1644, Parliament, and he was very, very high up in the government for many, many years. He basically functioned like the Secretary of State. On top of everything else, he was like the Secretary, he was called Secretary of Foreign Tongues. He handled all the correspondence and diplomacy with other countries on top of everything else. And so in Areopagitica, what he does is he says, oh, I see Parliament has come up with a new law. Parliament is afraid that too many Catholic books are being smuggled into Protestant England. So they want to crush uh, religious dissent, Catholic versus Eng English Protestantism. And the Parliament wants to shut down anyone who wants to criticize the current government that, he, that you know, he's involved in. And he said, if you censor if you don't allow books and ideas to circulate and people to speak freely, then you will actually end up squeezing truth out and tyranny will rule. So shockingly enough, the idea of you know, freedom of speech and particularly freedom of expression in print should not be censored by and large. Now, he didn't like the Catholics and he wanted to get rid of them. But but what he what he's doing is he's making an anti-censorship argument as a Puritan. People have all the wrong ideas about Puritans. He he basically invents the idea of freedom of the press as we would now understand it. And he has this magnificent passage. He goes through the whole history of censorship from the ancient world to you know to 17th century. And he has this magnificent passage where he says, good and evil. Trying to remember this, good and evil, we know in the field of this world grow up together almost inseparably are and so inter and are so intervolved and interwoven that uh hardly with difficulty could psyche separate the seeds right so if you know the myth of psyche right she you know offends the gods and so she's sent into the underworld and her job you know she offends the gods because she's mortal she falls in love with cupid cupid falls in love with her they want to have an affair but he's an immortal she's mortal can't you tell the difference between the gods and the humans and so they send her into the underworld. She has this big pile of seeds, black seeds and white seeds, tiny. And she has to separate them. Black, white, black, white, black. In other words, the punishment fits the crime. You need to learn to make distinctions. The classical dictum of uh, semper distinguere. Always make distinctions. It's the key to clear thought. 
Learn to make good distinctions. You fail to make good distinctions, your thought is muddled. So psyche decedes, right? So he says, it is so difficult to tell between good and evil that it's like two twins cleaving together. He said, good and evil came into the world like two twins cleaving together. And so what Milton does in one sentence is he brings in a classical metaphor. He brings in a biblical metaphor in front of that and then another biblical metaphor, right? Right. Good and evil, we know, in the field of this world grow up together. That's the parable of the talents. Can you separate the wheat and the tares? Can we separate the wheat and the tares? No, only the angels can do that. You can't always separate everything good and evil in the world. You just can't do it. You can't weed the fake Christians out of your church all the time. And then he goes to this pagan metaphor of psyche, learning how to discern the seeds of black and white. And he says, that's futile too, because every time she makes the two piles, black and white, Aeolus, the wind comes in and blows them back together. And now you've got the gray. And then the last metaphor is a double biblical reference, which is into Genesis. And it's two twins leaping together into the world, but they have cleaved together. Well, who are the two twins? Jacob and Esau, right? And Esau makes the soup and, and or, or, or Jacob makes the soup and Esau's out, honey, right? And he fool, you know, Jacob fools his father and steals Esau's blessing. You're like, wait a minute. What, what father can't tell one twin son from another, even though they're twins? The problem is their father is blind, right? His eyes are dim. And so the totality of that is that your problem is not that good and evil aren't clear. It's that because you're fallen and broken in sin, your ability to tell the difference between good and evil is all messed up. And you have to learn through practice how to discern more and more carefully and make better and better distinctions and learn how to choose the good over the evil, right? He says, I cannot praise a fugitive and cloistered virtue. You can't lock yourself away from the world. You can't run away from all sin because sin is inside of you, not outside of you. He said, you have to learn through practice, and reading is a good way to do it, through practice how to not only distinguish, but prefer good over evil. So you develop your taste for the good over the evil. And that's his argument against censorship. If you say, well, you can't have anything dangerous, not that you should be looking for things that are dangerous, but you will never learn to prefer that which is truly good. Yeah. So that that's not only is that Milton's most important piece of prose, that's probably the most important piece of intellectual prose in the entire Renaissance. I think. That's great. That's a great start. Um, maybe one more question about Paradise Lost, and this is another one that you could probably talk as long as you as long as you wanted to about. Um, so you mentioned the kind of explicit purpose of Paradise Lost, Milton uh, says, is to justify God's ways to man. I was yeah. wondering if you wanted to speak uh, a little bit to, you know, what kind of need is there reading, like, the Genesis account and onwards um, to justify God's ways to man, and kind of why is poetry the way to do that? Um, what yeah. kind of need? poetry film yeah yeah that's great milton chose a, a a poetic career because um he says at one point you know he hopes as he develops as a poet over his career of reading and studying and, and writing to he says um to attain to something like prophetic strain i think it's at the end of l'allegro right um uh, no uh, uh the the melancholy poem il penseroso and so he said that God gift, gives the gift of poetic, rhetorical, linguistic clarity and beauty to some people. And he uses that for his own purposes. So on the one hand, you'll have a Moses, eh, I'm rude and slow of speech. And then you'll have a Peter, yeah, we're unlearned and ignorant men. But then go read the Gospel of John or read Paul or read Isaiah or Ezekiel, where the rhetoric is soaring beyond belief. God uses every level of talent because it's never about the talent or about the person. It's always about the God who gives, right? And so Milton has a belief that many of the reformers and a large number of the Catholics held as well, that, that rhetoric has a place, it has use. You don't want to depend on it utterly, but 
if truth is presented beautifully, it will be persuasive, right? Aristotle's famous opening to the rhetoric is, rhetoric is the study of all available means of persuasion. The only point of use in rhetoric, which is kind of a subset of language, is to persuade, to convince people to, to come over to your side, that you have something worth worth listening to and agreeing with, right? And so Milton believes that God has given him the, the, the facility in numerous languages, the ability and opportunity to study at a level that none of us can even begin to comprehend, and then to deploy that learning grounded in, uh, uh, you know, a reformed Anglican theology, which I, I think is orthodox. A lot of people want to accuse him of this or that, but, you know, every time I'm hanging around with Milton scholars, they're like, oh, Milton, X, Y, Z, and I'm like, oh, what about this passage? They're like, I never saw that before. So don't accuse him of something and then not be able to answer a question from someone who thinks he's actually orthodox. So Mil Milton has this has this great passage. This is uh, lines 24, 25, and 26, right at the opening of Paradise Lost Book One. It's, it's probably the most familiar part of the, the whole book. He says that the height of this great argument, so he's like, I'm not just writing a pretty poem. This is not a sonnet. This is an argument. This is, this is a narrative, but it's propositional. I'm going to convince you of something. That to the height of this great argument, I may assert, so what does it mean to assert something? to insist that it's true. I'm, I'm going to assert, I'm going to, I'm going to argue for this, that the height of this great argument, I may assert eternal providence. Okay, what does it mean if something's eternal? It means it's forever, has no beginning, has no end. I may assert eternal, what's the word, providence? American Christians don't really use that word too much anymore. People will talk about the sovereignty of God or the overarching power of God, but providence is a great English word because it goes back to Latin. Videre means to see. Video is first person singular present active indicative. I see. Video puelam, I see the girl, right? Uh, pro is a Latin prefix meaning before. Pro videre means to see before. God sees everything beforehand, but it doesn't mean that he just passively and actively sees it. He also provides, we would say in English, right? So providence means. God sees before and he provides for everything. In other words, he sovereignly designs in it. Augustinian, and I would say in my recent book, a, 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 a Calvinist kind of point of view, that to the height of this great argument, I may assert eternal providence. Now, what's the problem if you believe God's in charge of everything? That he designs and engineers and builds everything from the height of the heavens to the grass under your feet, from the motion of the electrons to everything that happens. If you're a sovereigntist, and many great theologians have been, some people go in a little different direction. Augustine is pretty or, or, oriented towards sovereignty. If you believe God is in charge of everything, and he's good, he's the creator, he's the designer, the disposer, and he sees everything beforehand, and he designs it beforehand, and then he deploys it all beforehand, you've got a big problem. What's the problem? the problem of Job, the problem of Ecclesiastes, a lot of the Psalms, and ultimately the problem from a human perspective of the cross. How can there be evil? Why would God make the devil? Why would he let his perfect creation, Adam, fall? Why does he let babies die? Why does he create tornadoes and hurricanes and disease? It's a very serious problem. The technical the theological term is theodicy, T-E-T-H-E-O, D-I-C-Y. It just means the judgment of God. How can God justly claim to be the creator of everything and good when there is evil in the world? How can he be just, right? And that's why the next line, the famous line, the line that explains Paradise Lost and justify the ways of God to men. The whole point of Paradise Lost is that he's going to assert that God sees everything, plans and designs everything, and it all goes bad until his redemption, and yet he is perfectly just. Thank you so much. Um, in the chat, we have a, a, a couple students expressing that they, they themselves are aspiring poets. Yay! Um, Someone was awake. Wonderful. I love that. I tell yeah. students I've been teaching for so long that I can teach in my sleep and probably in yours. <laughs> That's great. 
Um, Dr. Warner, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I think everyone on the on the chat wishes they could take a class with you now and, and talk more about them. That's um, great. great. It's been wonderful. Really appreciate you. And thank you to everyone who came. And thanks for your time. Um, we hope to see you soon. Yeah, maybe you'll see me in Italy. Maybe you'll come live in a castle in Italy with me for six weeks in Tuscany and we'll visit Venice. <laughs> or in San Rome. And by the way, you don't have to be a TMU student to go to TMU Italy. You can apply from outside. I always hold one or two slots for people from other schools that want to come and join us over there as long as you're a believing Christian and you want to see Italy and study art and culture through the lens of biblical theology. We'd love to have you. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know that. That's great. I would say to anyone on here, take the deal. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dr. Warner. Have a good night.